Chinese Premier Li Keqiang begins a three-day visit to Russia, which comes as the two countries celebrate 70 years of diplomatic ties and look to start a new era in their relations. China and Russia hope to cooperate further in dealing with major issues as big changes continue to alter the world order. So what could bilateral relations look like in the near era? What are, the, what are some of the lessons from the past uh, 70 years and where does the U.S. fit into the picture to discuss these issues and more? I'm happy to be joined in the studio by Dr. Zhao Hai, research fellow with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and Rick Dunham, a visiting scholar from Tsinghua University. And via satellite from Moscow, Viktor Olevich, political analyst and lead expert at the Center for Actual Politics. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Ray. Welcome to our discussion here, gentlemen. First, uh, Dr. Zhao Hai, what's your definition for the very eye alluring catchphrase of a comprehensive strategic partnership of a coordination between Russia and China? I mean, the special relationship has always uh, generated the headlines whenever we take a look at this bilateral relationship that followed a roller coaster trajectory since 1949. Exactly. So, uh, first of all, this is a very unique title for the relationship between uh, Russia and China right now. Uh, in uh, pretty much uh, for the, all the other countries, we have different kind of uh, or different names, categories of partnerships. Uh, for uh, Russia and China relationship, we call it a strategic, a comprehensive strategic partnership uh, uh, for cooperate of cooperation coordination uh, in the new era, which was uh, just happened about three months ago uh, in late May, early June. So that's a new name created for the new era, meaning that this relationship is being uh, uh, upgraded once again uh, after 2011. So as you mentioned, in the past 70 years, there's the up and downs in this relationship from the uh, 70 years, exactly 70 years ago when uh, the new China was established. Uh, the Soviet Union was the first to recognize China, and back then, uh, they were in this honeymoon period uh, for a couple of years when the two countries are very, very close. They are, uh, actually signed a treaty to become allies. Uh, and then later on, uh, as you uh, have described, there's a roller coaster relationship between the two countries. But today, I think uh, we're in the uh, probably best relationship in history, comparable to the 19, early 1950s. It seems for years, uh, um, since the height of the Cold War, China has been regarded by many policymakers in the States and in the West uh, in general as the most influential swing vote in shaping. Uh, world politics. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, for example, who advocates for uh, equilibrium of polar politics, a, a realistic uh, scenario, always uh, uh, takes China as a, a very influential bargaining chip. This time around, it seems uh, Russia is being used by this uh, policymaker, Dr. Henry Kissinger, as a bargaining chip. I mean, wh what do you make of the American uh, considerations uh, in shaping the future of the world or new world order? Well, I do think that during the Cold War, there was the Kissinger theory of triangulation, of, uh, of playing off uh, China and the Soviet Union, and to see uh, have the United States uh, try to uh, drive a wedge in between. I think with the, with the demise of the Soviet Union, it changed because China was seen as the second most important nation in the world uh, in America, where Americans thought uh, that Americans were the sole superpower. Now I think that you have a fractured world. Uh, Russia clearly has come on as a military uh, and, and a uh, social media power, but uh, it's not an economic power. And China is a military and an economic uh, power. The United States now wants to figure out how can the United States triangulate and uh, Donald Trump wanted to move toward Russia, but there's been a lot of resistance in the establishment in America and in the Congress to that. Uh, I understand your feelings to swing from past to present uh, in shaping our perception about Russia and this uh, uh, most important uh, bilateral relationship uh, uh, in the Far East. Uh, let's uh, go to Viktor Olevich for his uh, thoughts on the definition of uh, strategic uh, a comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination. I'd like to have your definition, Victor. 
Well, you correctly described the relationship between uh, Russia and the People's Republic of China over the past uh, more than half century as a roller coaster ride. Of course, as my colleague in uh, uh, in Beijing uh, said, uh, it first started with Moscow being the first power to recognize the People's Republic of China. And then by the end of Nikita Khrushchev's uh, rule, the relationship uh, soured, and the, it really came to a... Uh, uh, the, the peak of the confrontation was at the end of the 1960s when there were border clashes in the uh, Far East between the Soviet uh, border forces and the Chinese. And then when the Cold War was over by the late 1980s and early 1990s, as the United States became the only the, the sole hegemon, the sole ge geopolitical hegemon, it was uh, obvious to both Moscow and Beijing that uh, the strategic, that, that the relationship between them uh, should be modified, and that is when the strategic partnership uh, first uh, started to form in the 1990s, because uh, it was understood in both capitals that only together uh, Russia and China could uh, counterbalance the, uh, the uh, sole superpower, which was now the United States. And uh, uh, this relationship, the strategic partnership between Moscow and Beijing, uh, grew closer through the years. But as Donald Trump became uh, the president of the United States in, the, uh, in 2016, and even before that, uh, with the Pivot to Asia program uh, under b the Barack Obama administration, which was uh, quite obviously uh, turned against, uh, against and used against China, the relationship grew even closer. And today, as the Trump administration attempts to wage a uh, type of a Cold War against both Russia and China, this relationship is uh, growing closer and likely to grow even closer. I also agree with uh, the, my colleague in Beijing on that there were forces uh, within the Donald Trump administration which were at first uh, disposed towards using, uh, possibly uh, using Russia somehow uh, uh, in, a, in a new geopolitical combination against China. But they were defeated uh, by the majority of the American foreign policy establishment. And at this point, Washington is continuing to wage uh, a cold war both against Moscow and against uh, Beijing. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, hi. Here is the issue of mutual trust. Now, given the uniqueness and uh, old rivalries that characterized the bilateral relationship during the Cold War, and we all understand that the Russia is known for being ambitious globally since the Tsar years. So, um, do you believe the majority of the Chinese could trust the Russians or the other way around? I mean, it, it takes time to rebuild the trust uh, with the end of the Cold War. Uh, the vision of politicians is one thing, but majority perception about each other is quite another. Yeah, I think in international politics, common interest is more important and is the base for building common trust. And over the years, you can see that uh, China and Russia, uh, as our colleague in Moscow correctly pointed out, uh, we share more and more common interest because of the common threat and geopolitical changes in the last uh, uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, for Russia, I think uh, that sort of rule awakening comes in uh, 2007 when the West decided to expand NATO uh, further east. East were the expansion of the NATO. And, and, in and for China, in Europe, right. same thing. And, and for China, when the United States sort of sided with other countries, challenged China's sovereignty in eastern and chi uh, southern China Sea. So I think in many cases, you can see that it's it is this third power, the United States, that actually uh, giving the incentive and motivated two countries to get closer to form this strategic partnership of coordination. So I want to emphasize one more thing. The coordination that is different from cooperation is that uh, Russia and China have more dimensions of cooperation, particularly in the military and security area. And uh, uh, Russia and China are uh, two permanent members of the UN Security Council. Uh, I remember uh, upon one occasion when uh, uh, Foreign Minister and now State Councillor Mr. Wang Yi said uh, almost on all global and regional issues, the Russia and China are able to maintain close consultation. Uh, they trust each other, they uh, consult each other, and they coordinate their positions on all major issues. So what do you think of this uh, uh, strategic consultation shared by Russia and China 
in uh, shaping their course of the power politics with the end of the Cold War. And do you think uh, this will serve to rebalance uh, the back to Asia approach by the United States? I do think that the Russia-China access uh, means that the United Nations will not act uh, on any major issue uh, without the consent of both of the countries. And I do think that there is a commonality of interest. Uh, Russia is often more hawkish. Uh, China stays out of military confrontation. Russia has uh, been active in Ukraine and in Syria and other places. China says uh, that uh, diplomacy is the answer, not military action. But in terms of geopolitical interests, they're in sync. And I do think that it counterbalances the United States. And I think we're seeing some major uh, shifts going on uh, it, around the edges of Europe, in Turkey uh, in particular, uh, and in southern Europe, where both Russia and China are making inroads diplomatically uh, with some of the both members of NATO, uh, but also members of the, uh, of the EU. And so I think that's where we should be looking in the next few years if we're looking about looking, talking about the extended reach of Russia and China diplomatically. Uh, given uh, so many common stakes uh, between Russia and China, and particularly this dynamic process of a geopolitical reconfiguration, Victor, why do you think the two governments in Moscow and Beijing refused to uh, forge what they did uh, back in 1950, the mutual defense treaty? Uh, so that uh, they could eff effectively rebalance the American influence. Uh, uh, I mean, the United States obviously seeks uh, to maintain its uh, position of a primacy uh, in the current world order. Victor. Well, uh, mm -hmm. well, at this point, at this point, we are seeing uh, closer cooperation uh, on the uh, in the military sphere, and this cooperation is becoming ever so closer with each uh, year. We are seeing. Uh, joint uh, air patrols even um, uh, between uh, Russia and China, which we have uh, not seen uh, before. And uh, the we are seeing cooperation on the in the sphere of military technologies. We are seeing major uh, uh, exchanges, sales of uh, Russian uh, military uh, hardware and technology to China. And uh, uh, so this cooperation uh, spreads both through foreign policy, the po foreign policy sphere and military cooperation. And uh, it is possible that new treaties uh, are, going to be, uh, are going to be worked out uh, in the coming months and uh, years as the geopolitical uh, confrontation between Russia and China on one hand and the United States and its uh, allies on the other hand uh, proceeds. Uh, so, uh, also, I would uh, note that uh, attempts by Washington and some of its allies uh, to sow mistrust between uh, Moscow and Beijing and uh, possibly to, uh, to, to, to uh, break in with some sort of offers to either one are bound to fail in the near future simply because Russia, Moscow understands very well, very clearly that anything uh, the United States uh, has to offer uh, is uh, uh, belies it's, it, it's much less than Russia would risk from any sort of confrontation with China. Russia does not want uh, a confrontation with China uh, at, uh, f for some benefits from the West. This is simply not going to work out. And the experience Russia has had for the past 30 years in its relationship with the West, with the United States, uh, with Great Britain and their closest allies, uh, speaks very well to that. So all, uh, any attempts by the Trump administration or possibly by its successors in the White House to sow discord between China and Russia are bound, uh, are bound to fail. They, uh, they are simply not, uh, not able to realize this uh, at, at this point. Victor, you know, for years, uh, the Chinese policymakers and the majority of the elites have tried very hard to figure out uh, what is uh, the true Russia, what R Russia really wants, since for centuries Russia has been quite divided between Europe and Asia. Um, but uh, since the takeover, or take back of a Crimea, uh, Russians were punished 
with the ouster of your membership from G7 um, and economic sanctions uh, are still in place, uh, does it mean that uh, Russians end up opting for Russia under the heavy influence and uh, impact of economic sanctions? It, it's something that you had to do, not completely out of satisfaction. Uh, so what, what do you think of the efforts by Russian elites to re-identify Russian history, the position of Russia in the present day world order? I mean, we have been wondering aloud what Russia stands for. This situation is not new or unique in Russian history. In fact, one of the symbols, historic symbols of Russia is a uh, double-headed, two-headed eagle. And one of the heads of the Russian eagle looks east, and the other head looks west. And that signifies that Russia, throughout its history, has uh, sought to become a bridge between the east and the west, and that it can never be completely isolated by, uh, by one of the sides. So these attempts by the West, uh, led by the United States, to quote-unquote isolate Russia, place it under uh, severe uh, financial and political sanctions, uh, uh, take it out of the so-called G8 and uh, some other international organizations, have not had the desired effect, because uh, Russia can always uh, turn to its neighbors and its partners in the East and, uh, and expect a more robust and a beneficial economic, political, geopolitical and cultural relationship with them, uh, including China and uh, other uh, uh, nations, uh, nations of Southeast Asia and others. And so throughout its history, Russia has never been uh, intent on only developing its relationship with the West or only following uh, a sort of a, a Western uh, pattern of development. Russia seeks to balance its relationship with its uh, Western and Eastern allies and partners. And uh, whenever one of the uh, sides uh, decides to pressure Russia in a significant uh, manner. But Russia, in, in many uh, ways, I'm afraid, Victor, uh, Russia uh, to, to seek sought to learn from the West, to draw inspirations from uh, uh, democracy in the West. For example, you look at the history of Decembrists in Irkutsk. Uh, those uh, elite army officers uh, went to Paris after the 1812 war, and they learned a lot from the French Revolution. They came back with the spirit of constitution. They wanted to copy the French lessons, but they ended up being sent to the far east of Siberia. Many of them died on their way to the uh, bleak uh, uh, part of your territory. But uh, l let me come back to the Beijing studio and uh, continue our discussion about history of Russia, which means a lot for how we look at the future of the bilateral relationship. Uh, uh, Russia is uh, proud of being a third Rome, if you look at the history, and uh, it's known for the pursuit of a messiah spirit, uh, namely uh, as a savior uh, uh, of the world. W what do you think of the global ambition, the global agenda of Mr. Putin, despite the uh, weakening of its national strength since the end of the Cold War? Well, I think uh, Russia, is, um, as we have pointed out, um, the symbol of Russia is two-headed eagle, looking east and looking west but also comes with the expansion of the old Russian Empire that comes with the, the insecurity of the surrounding regions because your borderline is too, too long and you have so many neighboring countries and, in, and living in your territory you have so many different ethnic groups and different nations. So that causing the, a lot of problems when Russia needs to maintain a certain buffer zone or certain security area uh, around and there's always the insecurity, the perceived threat from the outside, particularly from the the West, because Russia had experienced one, uh, again and again from Napoleon uh, later to Hitler uh, the invasions. So I think it is necessary for Russia to maintain a level of security and cooperation with other countries. And in the East, cooperating with China was one of the most important historical choice uh, from almost two, uh, 150 years ago. So that's uh, a, a long-lasting legacy of the interaction between the two countries. I want to add one point that uh, Russia and China does not have to have, uh, uh, have a security treaty because different from the Cold War era, now the two countries combined uh, have enough deterrence to any 
uh, threat of, uh, from the outside, they don't need to formalize this alliance. And also China, in principle, is a non-alliance country. So China does not recognize the value of so-called military alliance, particularly in the Asia Pacific. So adding that together, I don't think we need that kind of formal uh, security treaty uh, to, uh, and particularly to, to make sure that the neighboring countries are not fear uh, of what the intentions are for Russia and China. We're good enough to maintain peace and stability in this region. And what do you think of this uh, issue that, well, that neither country, neither government seeks to forge a treaty alliance with the other? That is correct. What I think Vladimir Putin wants most of all is respect, I mean, respect for the greatness of Russia as he sees it, as so many Russians see it. Uh, and then we can debate whether it is to reconstitute the Soviet empire or the czarist uh, Russian empire meaning beyond uh, the, the post-Cold War uh, borders. Uh, Russia wants security, as is seen by the government in Moscow. I mean, I think that many of these inter interests intersect with Chinese interests. Uh, I mean, China wants respect as a superpower, as a great world power, and I don't believe there's any need for uh, for, for a mutual defense treaty. I agree, China is a non-aligned country and would violate the principles. And in fact, the uh, treaty alliance uh, uh, that we signed with the Russians uh, in 1950, according to Professor Shen Zhihua from the uh, Eastern China Normal University, uh, dragged China into the bloody regional conflict, the first of its kind since the end of the Second World War in the Korean Peninsula. With that bitter, in my, uh, bitter lesson in mind, perhaps uh, uh, neither Russia nor China uh, wants to go back uh, to that chapter of history, a bloody chapter, by the way. Now, may I go back to uh, Victor for his uh, analysis on why China and Russia decides to get united uh, in defending uh, the principle of multilateralism as opposed to unilateral policy moves by President uh, Donald Trump? Well, both uh, China and Russia have seen what uh, unilateral uh, foreign policy looks like in the past uh, 30 years from the United States. And both Moscow and Beijing seeks a, uh, the creation of a new multipolar uh, structure of international relations where a single power, whether it's the United States or any other uh, power, cannot dictate its will uh, on other uh, actors in the international arena. And so both Moscow and Beijing are interested in a uh, more, uh, in an, uh, more, a, a more representative uh, architecture of international relations where uh, interest, the interests of each power can be taken into account uh, to prevent various uh, international crises. Uh, that where interests of different powers uh, would be taken into account uh, before uh, serious changes to uh, foreign policy courses would be implemented. And uh, this uh, would, uh, should be uh, a more stable world uh, with uh, less uh, military and uh, economic strife than we had uh, seen in the past uh, few decades when the United States was wielding uh, its power as the uh, sole uh, geopolitical uh, hegemon. And so this is one of the reasons that both Moscow and China seek to, uh, do not seek a unilateral uh, approach. Good point, good point, uh, Victor. Now, uh, obviously, foreign, um, foreign affairs. Peter like uh, Navarro, Steve Bannon, Lighthizer, Secretary Pompeo, all want to have a zero-sum game to follow uh, uh, to follow the advocacy of President Donald Trump in shaping the bilateral relationship, the, particularly the trade war between the two biggest economies. Uh, now, having said that, uh, it seems uh, right in this area where Americans lose, Russians would gain. For example, agricultural produce. Do you think uh, uh, agricultural supplies from Russia are likely to replace the United States uh, in terms of soybeans and beef, uh, so on and so forth? What do you think of this, such sort of stuffs? Well, uh, of course, the uh, Russian agricultural sector uh, is uh, very successful, has been very successful, enjoyed success in the past uh, few years, in fact, more than a decade. And Russia is looking to replace at least part 
of uh, of uh, agricultural uh, exports from uh, from the United States. Uh, the United States is not an irreplaceable economic partner for China. Obviously, exactly. Let, let me, let uh, me go back to uh, Dr. Zhaohai for his analysis on whether Russia can replace the United States in exporting agricultural produce to China at this defining moment when uh, pork and soybeans are both in short supply. Well, the short answer is no for now. Uh, but I want to point out that uh, the agricultural sort of revolution that is happening in Russia in the 21st century is one of the most important things uh, happened for Russia because we knew uh, Russia is a very important energy power but for a very long time Russia is lagging behind in terms of agricultural production and we know that Ukraine was the bread basket for Europe probably now, Mexico and Brazilians uh, uh, also Brazil could be very good partners but, but Russia is rapidly catching up and uh, they are uh, they're now self-sufficient. But Russia has a severe labor force. shortage. I mean, does it mean that the more the Chinese labor force would Here's have to point. be required? Exactly. So my point is that Russia needs to open up its doors to accept more investment and uh, particularly liberalize its policies to accept more immigrant workers so that they can increase. With these factors, they can increase agricultural product and then uh, production and then export to China. Well, uh, before that, I don't think the current output can replace uh, American export to, to China. Uh, what do you think of uh, the importance? Only partially, that? only partially. So Ch I mean, China is looking Rick. for leverage. It does not want to be dependent on the United States for food imports, just like the United States. We don't States. want to be held hostage right. by... Well, uh, and, and my comparison is, is, the, uh, is the 1970s with Americans' oil, uh, oil dependency on the Persian Gulf. So China does not want that. Russia is part of the answer, part of the equation. It's just one, it could produce just one-tenth of the soybeans that are imported from the United States, but it's a piece of it if you add it with Brazil, if you add it with other countries. Um, and I think China, after this trade war, after the Trump actions, is going to be pursuing alternative strategies so that China is never too dependent on imports from any one country, particularly if that country is one that calls itself a strategic rival. Thank you so much. Let me go back to Victor very quickly before we conclude this discussion on uh, Russia-China relationship. Victor, um, there's no question that the current bilateral relationship between Moscow and Beijing looks very good. It enjoys the glow of a mutual trust. Uh, look at the chemistry between President Putin and his Chinese counterpart, Mr. Xi Jinping. Now, our president has uh, visited Russia eight times, and uh, Putin and Mr. Xi Jinping have met for 31 times. Oh, my goodness. Uh, such a big number of uh, meetings. I mean, uh, uh, President Xi even celebrated the, the birthday party, uh, the, the birthday of your, of your President Putin in Bali Island. So very quickly, what do you think of uh, this uh, personal relationship and the importance for consolidating the bilateral ties? Very quickly, before we conclude the discussion. Well, the, 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 che the chemistry between uh, the Russian President and the head of uh, China is very important, of course. And uh, we expect to see a continuation of that. In fact, uh, the uh, visit uh, by the uh, Chinese Prime Minister Li Keqiang to Moscow and the fact that he's going to be to have a meeting uh, not just with his counterpart, not just with the Russian Prime Minister mm -hmm. Medvedev, but also with Putin speaks a lot to the, how important the relationship with China is for the Kremlin, for Moscow. Thank you very much, Victor. Certainly, we expect President Putin to show up at the military parade in commemorating the 70th anniversary of this bilateral relationship. Uh, that's a major event in this year. This year is, by the way, a very special year for the two countries. I'll see you next time. Thank you for being with us. Goodbye.